Hello and Happy New Year. I hope you all are well and having a wonderful start to your 2023. It honestly feels so weird saying that considering what a blur the last three years have been. There have been so many changes in my life, it still doesn't even really feel normal to me yet. But the one constant has been piano. So I thought it'd be appropriate that my first video of the new year be a practice vlog, a series I'm lovingly renaming Practice Chronicles. Today I'll be practicing a beautiful transcription of Schubert's Stention, originally composed in 1826 for voice and piano, then later transcribed for solo piano in 1838 by Liszt. It's one of those pieces that you've probably heard before, but maybe not remember exactly from where. Call me basic, but I immediately fell in love with it and I had to learn it. This actually isn't my first time learning this piece. I'm returning to it a few years later with a new perspective and more skills under my belt. I've really been enjoying learning it again and seeing my improvements, as well as reinterpret it with fresh ears and more nuance than I was capable of before. I found new ways of practicing this piece that made things a lot easier, and I want to share some of those tips with you today. If you found this video because you're also working on this piece, welcome to the channel. I hope you find this helpful. If you have any specific questions, don't hesitate to leave a comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. Something I didn't think about too much my first time around was the balance between the left hand and the right hand. The left hand is primarily playing these big chords, way more notes than the right hand is playing, and the chords are in the lower register, so it's quite easy for the left hand to overpower the right hand. Since I want the right hand to sound soft and delicate, that means the left hand needs to be even more soft and delicate. I had to do a lot of left hand only practice to train this, paying particular attention to how much weight I'm putting down. The left hand also has a lot of jumps, and that quick movement makes it very easy to unintentionally add an accent. I found that by slowing it down and taking a pause after each jump allowed me to be much more careful with how I played that chord. I can be more intentional with how much weight I'm putting down and train that into my muscle memory.
for a walk. Another really tricky section to balance is the quasi-violoncello section. The right and left hands are literally on top of each other, so it can feel a bit clumsy to play. My tip is to keep the left hand on top of the right hand. For some reason, my first time around, I did the reverse, but I realized the right hand is carrying the melody, so you want that hand to be closer to the keyboard, which will allow you to press more deeply into the keys. The left hand will just float over top and can be played light and soft. There are two 9 against 4 polyrhythms in this piece. I remember my first time learning it, I agonized over how to evenly divide the 9 against 4 and just drove myself insane trying to get it to be perfectly even. Let me tell you, it's not worth the stress. After learning many Chopin pieces with lots of different kinds of polyrhythms, I realized that as long as you're able to sell the phrasing, no one cares, or frankly, will even notice if everything's not perfectly even. Divide the notes in a way that's easy to play and just make sure that the phrase sounds good. If you're curious, here's how I divided the 9 against 4. Two right hand notes for every left hand note, except the third left hand note will get three right hand notes. I did it this way because I wanted to ease into the phrase, speed up a little bit, then slow down again. So it made sense to add the extra note where I wanted to speed up. Once I played up to tempo, I think it's hardly noticeable that it's not evenly divided. That secret will just be between you and me. This has got to be my favorite section of the entire piece. I just love the interaction between the lower voice and the higher voice. It really feels like there's a conversation happening and you get to have fun creating two different personas and figure out what they're trying to say to each other. Technically, it is challenging because you keep moving between one octave and another. 
it can be easy to get hung up on nailing the jumps that you lose sight of what really matters, the conversation that's happening between the two voices. I found that it was a lot easier to focus on the phrasing first, then worry about the jumps later. Figure out exactly how you want each voice to sound, how you want one to respond to the other, how loud, how soft, how fast, how slow. Nail that first. Try practicing with big gaps between the call and the response so that you're not worrying about the timing and you can just focus on phrasing and texture. Take your time moving from one octave to the other, making sure you're completely relaxed before you start playing the next phrase. Once this becomes really comfortable in your body, you can start to decrease the time between the phrases until it's back to tempo. What's cool about this is you can even experiment with how much time to take between the phrases and incorporate that into your interpretation. By this point, you'll be so good at moving between the phrases that it should be pretty easy. The last thing I want to talk about are the big broken chords and arpeggios at the very end of the piece. I remember really struggling with them my first time around. I want them to sound light and sparkly, but the notes are super spread out and for someone with small hands, I found it so hard to play it fast enough to create that texture. This time I found a workaround that I'm pretty proud of. I decided to share the arpeggios between my right and left hands rather than try to play the whole thing with my right hand. Here are the fingerings I used. The blue numbers are for the left hand and the red numbers are for the right hand. The first big broken chord, I bring my left hand over to play the very last note. Then I quickly bring my left hand back to play the next broken chord and my right hand plays the very last note. The next two arpeggios, I bring both my hands up and play the first two notes with my left hand and all the remaining notes with my right hand. Breaking it up like this means I have enough fingers to play all the notes in the arpeggios without having to make any jumps. This allows me to play them much faster and more fluidly. I'm not sure if this is something that will only work for me, but if you do decide to give it a try, please let me know how it goes. <laughs> 